The reason I really have focused on value is because the trajectory of my life has taken me through a whole host of different uh, seats around the table. And I think where you stand depends on where you sit for a lot of this conversation. And so my background actually is in uh, community work and social work. And I started um, as the founder of the Larkin Street Youth Center in San Francisco, which works with uh, homeless kids and teenage prostitutes, and is a you know, very successful multi-service center program. But at the end of my 20s, I had to kind of recognize the fact that uh, I had bought into a lie. right? And the lie that I had bought into was that uh, social workers are about changing the world. Right? And the fact is, the way that we've structured the nonprofit sector and our understanding of social value and impact has less to do with impact and a lot to do with politics, perception, and persuasion. It has to do with basically uh, saying to folks, uh, intent is impact. And we mean to do well. We've created this whole uh, area of work to do good in the world, and yet we're not really going to drive performance metrics into our capital allocation decisions within that space. The reason that one nonprofit gets more money than another oftentimes has more to do with their ability to schmooze politicians and work the system, uh, give a good site visit to a program director where you make sure that one of your kids comes up and engages them in a very deep and meaningful conversation, and then you get a big grant, right? Um, and, and there is something just wrong with that for me. And so uh, I basically burn out in that role and through a number of uh, kind of parts of the journey that we could talk about over whiskey sometime, I ended up working for George Roberts, who's the founding partner of Colbert Kravis Roberts, the leverage buyout firm. And George had a different career track than the one I had chosen, and had a, but had a similar issue. And his issue was, as a business person who had uh, really created his wealth through free enterprise, through the market system, he had a certain way that he thought about how you do business, how you manage assets, how you invest, how you create value in the marketplace. And He's a, a generous guy and wants to be helpful philanthropically, but a lot of the philanthropic conversation just did not engage him on any level. Because, again, it was, uh, there wasn't a logic to the allocation of capital. There weren't formal metrics to be able to tell whether or not you're moving forward or back. And it just was not a very compelling kind of value proposition to invest in. And so I spent then 10 years working with George, running a fund with we took philanthropic capital and invested in market rate businesses run by nonprofit organizations to employ formerly homeless people. And so we were like right in the middle of this conversation in the 90s as a lot of this, uh, these ideas started to get traction. And I, I kind of uh, found myself, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about the SROI work in a minute, but found myself uh, basically trying to take business ideas and acumen and practice and drive it toward community good and impact. And I found myself giving, conversation, giving presentations at mainstream for-profit social investor sessions uh, on this issue of how do you track social performance and value. And you know, this is 10 years ago, 12 years ago, was kind of shocked that these folks who presented themselves as for-profit investors in social something had no way to describe the nature of the value they were creating through their capital allocations. And so, I started moving further and further away from traditional philanthropy and more toward market rate investing for multiple returns and ended up um, working for uh, Generation Investment Management out of London, which is the uh, global public equities fund that was launched by Al Gore and David Blood, a $6 billion fund, and then ultimately working for a fund of hedge funds group. And as I kind of moved through these different stages, I, I realized that um, well, my career as a social worker had gone horribly astray. That was one, <laughs> that was one thing I realized. Uh, and I also realized that the reason that I could play through these different spheres or these silos or whatever you want to describe them as was that I honestly am agnostic about structure you know, and about the vehicle. Because over time, I've just developed this real idea of passion around that it really doesn't matter if it's for profit or non profit or if it's philanthropic or market rate. The focus needs to be on understanding what's the value we're trying to advance and create, and how do we really uh, set, create a set of investment instruments and organizational forms that can capture and maximize that value over time. And so all of which really has brought me to focus on the notion that, you know, really at the beginning of the day, there's just two questions, right, for any of us. And I say 
at the beginning and at the end, because I think when we were kids, we actually knew all of this, right? And what happens is, the older you get, the more it gets beaten out of you. And when you're a kid and you get like a lollipop and, and you're like, this is great. And you're like, this is worth a nickel. I spent my nickel on my lollipop and this is great value for the nickel kind of thing, right? It's all kind of mushed together. And when you die and you're looking back over whatever number of years you have to work with, I doubt you're gonna sit there and go, wow, I made a ton of cash, right? <laughs> and that's the measure of worth of your having lived. I think the measure of worth of your having lived will be some combination of what you've created in the world on economic, social, and socioeconomic terms and in, with an environmental kind of overlay, and that that's really the point. And so as we stop for a period of time and reflect on what are we really doing, the fundamental question is, are you and your assets really maximizing your full potential value, and are all of your assets aligned strategically to achieve the goals and the impacts that you want to have over the course of your life. And so starting to like zero in more on the capital and the asset management side, we have to start then talking about fiduciary responsibility. So what does it mean to manage capital? What does it mean to have the responsibility to allocate funds in certain directions? And I think it's interesting when you listen to people talk about fiduciary responsibility because a lot of times the conversation begins and ends with financial responsibility for maximizing the financial performance of the capital under management. Right? And the duty of the fiduciary is to put capital to its highest and best use and generate more capital so that you can have more money to go do more things with. Right? And the fact is, the concept of fiduciary responsibility has evolved significantly over time and is continuing to evolve. And in fact, in, in the state of New York, there was a time where trustees were not allowed to invest in any other product or vehicle other than, wait for it, bonds issued by the state of New York. Right? You were not allowed to invest in real estate, no direct corporate investments, I mean, none of this. And it was really the fiduciaries, the trustees, who came back at the regulators and the attorneys and all this stuff and said, basically, that's not right. right? We have a broader responsibility. We have an obligation to manage these funds differently. And so therefore, we must have the right to invest in a variety of instruments. And so they, you know, 200 years ago, started shifting the nature of our understanding of fiduciary. And today, as Tessa can talk at, at great length and with great eloquence, institutional pension fund trustees clearly now may consider not only financial return, but also how social and environmental factors affect financial performance and return. And there's increasingly uh, movement in the pension fund space and the endowment space for those investors and fiduciaries to begin really thinking about how do these off balance sheet liabilities affect financial performance and how can their investing practices drive social and environmental value in return. The other part of this too is that when we talk about fiduciary obligation, a lot of times again we just focus on the financial part. We don't really recognize the fact that actually as fiduciaries we have a much broader uh, set of responsibilities and obligations. And those have to do with the mission of the institution, ensuring that we're moving ourselves forward and that we're effectively using the resources and tools that we have available to us. And that at different levels of the organization, different folks have various responsibilities and obligations. And all of this really has to be taken into account when we talk about what it means to be a good fiduciary. And then lastly, in contributing to this idea of evolution, come on in, it's okay. Um, I think that uh, this will continue to be driven. And I think in part it gets driven by uh, demographics because the millennials, as they are coming up, uh, reject a bifurcated value proposition. Right? They basically reject the idea that the first order of life is to make money and the second order of life is to give it away. They really want to work and live in organizations that are maximizing some level of economic performance at the same time that they're doing good in the world. There's a real kind of shift in mindset around that. And that's being complemented by what I think of as the disgruntled boomers, who are basically folks who are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, who are kind of saying, you know, this is it. This is my life, right? This is what it is. This is how much money I probably will make. This is how much money I've made. And it's just not about the money, you know, at the end of the day. There's other things. There's other parts of a legacy that I want to leave to the next generation. And these two conversations are coming together in a very interesting way because <clears throat> in essence what it's doing 
is calling into question this bifurcated value proposition, this idea that you can disaggregate consideration of value in investing in an organizational management, and that either you join the nonprofit sector and you do good, but you don't drive economic performance, or you join the for-profit sector and you do well, and you drive economic value and performance, but not social returns. And really, at the end of the day, I would argue that all organizations are fundamentally whole, that they all have within them various levels of economic, social, and environmental value components that really interact and play and can be managed and maximized over time, and that this is really what we should be focusing on. And again, in a lot of the conversations around social entrepreneurship and cooperatives and this and that, a lot of the discussion tends to focus on the legality and the structure and why we can't do things. And yet, I'm always kind of amused because these are all self-imposed limitations that we've created. There's nothing that we've created in terms of legal form or structure that can't be modified, changed, or evolved. And so in the states, for example, obviously you have nonprofit organizations and you have for-profit LLC corporations, uh, but you're also seeing a whole host of hybrid entities kind of move through the center. And of course in Canada, you have a large cooperatives movement that really has kind of been in that middle space for a long time. So I think there's a lot of examples as you look around the world about how people are actually removing beyond the bifurcation and getting out of a zero-sum dissonance toward trying to capture and pursue uh, greater aspects of value creation. And again, I think that what we're talking about is the recognition that there's really two parts to the conversation. One having to do with the power of environmental and social factors to affect financial return. So in the case of uh, generation investment management, looking at publicly traded uh, corporations, they would say, it's not a, a direct impact investment as much as a consideration of how various uh, environmental and social factors will affect the business model of the firm that we're analyzing. And it's not that, it's not a moral question, right? This is not screen investing that I'm talking about here. It's not socially responsible anything, although there's a place for that. What the new conversation is moving toward is really a sense of saying, okay, if you're a transnational company, and you don't understand pandemics, and you're employing people in South Asia and Africa, you're gonna be in trouble as a company. And if you're uh, an insurance firm, and you're not thinking about how uh, global climate change is gonna affect the liability, the off balance sheet liability for your investments, you're gonna be in trouble. And again, it's not that you're looking for managers that have figured it out and have the right answer, as much as management that's kind of you know, leaning forward on the balls of its feet and not gonna be caught back on its heels. And the bet is, over time, more and more of these types of factors will come home to roost. And those investors who are long-term asset owners, as opposed to, I mean, like if you're a day trader and all you care about is you know, the number at the end of the day, this probably isn't for you. Most of us are not day traders. Most of us institutionally, in terms of endowments, in terms of our personal wealth and assets, are playing to a 10 to 20 to 30 to 50 year time horizon. And if that's what your orientation is, then you, you've got to pay attention to the off balance sheet things that don't come up in traditional financial analytics. So you have to create, and we'll go into this a little bit, a, a host of metrics that are enhanced. They're enhanced analytics that help you kind of get a better wrap around relative to the value proposition which translates down to this idea of the power of financial assets to basically generate social and environmental impacts. And in this case, I'm thinking more in terms of philanthropy, impact investing, direct private equity investing. There, there's a host of, again, instruments and, and vehicles. But the idea is it's the leverage and combination of these two parts that give you total portfolio performance with multiple returns, with maximizing total blended value. And that's what we're trying to move toward here. So, as we think about capital, again, we've been basically sold on this idea of a bifurcated value proposition for capital. So what you do is rate, pillage, and philanthropy. Okay? You make as much money as you can, however you can make it, and then you spend a chunk of time at the end of your life giving it away to try to like, make up in some part for the damage you did in the pursuit of that wealth. Right? <laughs> and so what we do is we create these philanthropic institutions and we get a tax consideration on the front end for making the investment into the, into the foundation. So right there, I'm suspicious, because I'm kind of like, okay, wait a minute. 
you get a tax break on the front. That's your financial consideration. But those dollars, the 95% that creates that endowment, if you will, uh, is always managed only with reference to financial performance and return. So here's the business model that you're being asked to accept. And again, if you do like private equity or if you invest in any kind of small businesses, what business would you invest in if the entrepreneur came to you and said, here's, here's this great idea, I'm really passionate about it, we're going to really change markets and consumers and the whole nine yards, and here's, here's the deal, here's the term sheet. For every dollar you give me, I'm going to take 95 cents and I'm going to put it on the shelf, and I'm going to take a nickel out of every dollar, I'm going to take my administrative costs out of that, so I get like two or three percent admin overhead. So I'm going to take two and three cents, and I'm going to use that to execute the business strategy. But that's what we do in philanthropy. And we think of that as kind of good philanthropic practice. And the problem, of course, is that it raises a really uncomfortable question, which is what percent of your assets are actually driving to advancing your institutional mission? And I would argue that if it's two or three percent, that's probably not enough. Now, I would not argue that it's got to be 100% all the time. I don't have an answer because I think, as is true of all investing, different investors have different priorities and goals and intents, and everybody has to kind of find their own appropriate allocation. But the fact is, 2 or 3% is not enough, as far as my, in my mind. And I think that the, the new golden rule is basically one that says something along the lines that portfolio size doesn't define the breadth of your vision or the, the tools that you can apply in creating the future you desire. And that's the key thing, is that it's about much more than grants and social impact. It's about maximizing total performance and value. And so when we think about an investment strategy that drives multiple returns, what we're talking about is a strategy that looks at the whole, that basically is more of a unified investment piece. And you'll give me just a second here, I gotta take off this coat. So I'm roasting as I'm starting to talk. Um, and so there's a couple of parts to this. Actually, probably more than a couple, but in any event, we'll uh, start with a couple. And what I'm saying here is that as we think about uh, a, a portfolio allocation, what we usually do is we think about this part here, and we think about that in terms of financial performance and return. And then we think about payout here in terms of grants that are pursuing social value. And what I would argue is that when we're making our grants, we need to understand that there is a, a social risk and return equation that's in play. And we need to structure our grants on terms that really uh, are, in fact, a philanthropic portfolio. And oftentimes what we do when we think about grant making is we just kind of have charitable gifts. And they're gifts. You, you, know, you uh, cut a check, it's going to drive by philanthropy. You write a check and you get a report a year later and you hope something good happened. And if you're strategic or uh, tactical, you get more engaged. But I mean, basically, it's a transactive piece. It's not an investment approach. Whereas if we take an investment approach to philanthropy, you can see something that says that a program grant is really like kind of uh, low risk. Uh, if you think about making a program grant to a homeless organization that's feeding folks, we pretty much know how much it's going to cost to feed 100 people. So here's 1,000 bucks and here's X number of people who get fed. You, you pretty much know that equation. So it's a pretty easy transaction to make. But if you're wanting to invest in a collaboration of five nonprofits that are creating affordable housing within a given neighborhood, and you need to build the organizational infrastructure to be able to execute that strategy over, let's say, a five to 10 year time horizon, that's a much higher risk uh, uh, exposure. And so the combination of these two are important because you don't, it's not like you, you don't do one, but you do the other. It's you're, you're doing both and, thank you. Um, but if you really want to, quote, solve the problem, maybe you decide what you need to do is move into public policy work. And so you start looking at doing more R&D, doing seed funding of innovative programs and strategies. And again, it's this combination of philanthropic investments in a portfolio management style that creates the impact and the value of doing philanthropy. But the trick here is, again, this represents really that 3 to 5% that we were talking about earlier. Whereas, and I'd also say, this represents money out the door. Okay? 
This is not revolving funds coming back to you. Whereas if you're doing, again, let's say housing, and you could structure a recoverable grant or a program-related investment that says that, all right, we're going to buy down the interest with our you know, social uh, license, if you will, and we're going to take on greater risk than a commercial banking institution might be able to do given the profile of its capital that it has to work with, and we're going to combine that with the grant piece, then you've got a situation where you can actually leverage funds. And not only are you leveraging funds in terms of the dollar value, if you put five in, you can leverage $100 later kind of thing, but you're also leveraging your own investments in order to begin to incrementally increase the amount of return and performance that you get for the assets under management. And then you begin moving over here to this side in the, in the public equity side and let's say the treasury note side where you have a set of instruments that you actually uh, can buy into that, that really mirror in some part, in some way, uh, mainstream traditional investment products, one of which is the, the community investment note, which uh, Calvert and RSF Finance uh, in the U.S. have done a lot of work around, and which uh, the Ottawa Community Loan Fund is going to be rolling out in the next, I think, three to six months as an offering here in Canada, but basically is a, a, a note that says you can select an interest return, zero to three, maybe zero to four percent, um, and it's in essence, you're buying a, a fixed note bond, is essentially what it looks like. Um, and instead of buying that instrument from the government, you buy it from a community finance institution, and they use that uh, capital then to finance small business development and housing in that community and in that region. And one of my biggest pet peeves about the nonprofit sector is that if all we did was manage our cash flow better, right? If all we did was manage our cash and cash equivalents, we could quadruple, if not create by 100 times the impact and leverage of the assets we have. But for some reason that I, I'm not quite clear on, we're more comfortable buying CDs from Bank of America than we are from a community development bank, even if the C, both CDs have the same profile and both of them are secured, in our case in the States, by FDIC, right? So your risk exposure is identical. And yet, for some reason, we like paying more money for the Wall Street folks than we do for the Main Street folks. And I, I don't understand that, but that's just a pet peeve. So I'll just <laughs> put that out there and move on. Um, but any event, and so the idea is that increasingly there are a whole host of vehicles and strategies and funds that investors are able to move their investments into in order to be uh, maximizing the greatest value. In this in this mass, you know, this rapidly growing field of social finance, and whatever we want to call it, and I'm, I'm, I'm with you on the on the duck, uh, because it's really frustrating. We have this kind of, you know, cacophony of, of terms that we have to work through. So it's very exciting at one level because it's out there, um, the fi helped enormously by the financial crisis. That's uh, we don't have to sell ethics anymore, uh, but. It's, it's very much a supply side story. It, you, we're, we're looking at finance um, and increasing, you know, the, or, or building a social capital market from a, a supply side perspective. And there's a couple of very important missing tools or links there, and the biggest one is the demand, of course. You know, we talk about due diligence and so on, and yes, of course, every investor is going to do the due diligence, whether it's a social investor or whether it's a uh, mainstream investor. <clears throat> they don't want to lose their, lose their shirts in one case, and they want to make sure that they make their social uh, return uh, in, in the other. And the, you know, you reference <clears throat> all the time to, uh, constantly to, to risk mitigation. One of the ways to mitigate risk is to be uh, to work in a more coordinated manner with those on the demand side, and there's a legacy for that as well. Uh, you know, your work with the REDF goes back to the 90s. You know, if you would have, you wouldn't have dreamed that you would have had this kind of a, um, uh, a, a talk uh, today. Uh, in, in, in at that time, I was working at the time, very early 90s, in, in microcredit. I mean, I'm, I'm an academic, but I with other, a group of other people founded the first microcredit institution in Canada. Um, and, you know, we were really, it was baby steps trying to figure, to figure this all out. We would never have known where to go uh, or where this, would, where this would go. But our work, and this is my own experience and many of us uh, in Canada, was to work very closely with intermediaries uh, who were able to um, 
help on the demand side, not just to define, not just to identify, you know, where the investment would take place, but also to work with these potential um, uh, initiatives. These call them whatever you will. Again, we get we have a duck problem: social enterprise, um, cooperative, community-based enterprise. But to to increase the investment readiness of these, in many cases, uh, fragile. Uh, uh, enterprises at the time that were redlined and had no access to, to any kind of investment capital. If we fast forward, those intermediaries have grown. I mean, in the States, when, when I think of, of the, um, I think they changed their name, but it used to be the National Association of Community uh, Loan Funds, now the National Community Capital Association. These are trade associations that provide help on the demand and on the supply side. I think this is, this is a critical uh, absence in uh, a, a new risk, that if we build a social capital market that begins to go belly up because um, it's doing all kinds of good things without the preparation of the enterprises, the organizations that they're going to invest in, uh, notwithstanding due diligence one-on-one, -on -one, these uh, th this is a this is a very high risk. So the m risk mitigation can certainly be addressed, uh, and I see George nodding. I mean, you know, this is this is the reality of of communities to be able to integrate social finance into 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 territory, into space, where, where we're despatializing a lot of of this. When you know, I'm sure in your early REDF work, I mean, you were in you know in 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 communities, you were in neighborhoods. A lot of this is despatialized. I'm a big fan of the IRIS also, and I participate in their webinars, and I've learned enormously, and they're very sophisticated, and, they're, and it's interesting. But it, it's a worry because um, well, it's not going to be hedge funds. These are not the same kinds of people. But there's a risk that it's going in that direction in the sense that it's very technically seductive. It works, and it's very interactive. It has this wiki component to it. But the distance becomes even greater. So I, I, you know, I think what I'm saying is for all of us who are, whether we're practitioners or, or whether we're, um, you know, researchers, uh, we can't do it all. We have to work with, with people like you and others who are the architects of this social finance, but we've got to bring it back uh, into communities. And then the other, the other point I'd like to make is that there also seems to be and here I'm, I'm, I'm um, you know, caricaturing in some ways, but there seems to be a one-size-fits-all approach to this. And it's mostly, if not entirely, um, dead instruments that we're talking about. And uh, this is a problem, too. And if you, you know, if you go, you know, if we, if we take, leave the big picture and, and go into a community, go into a community in Ottawa or, or in Montreal or New York, for that matter, uh, Again, there's, there's an absence of consideration of the need for a diversity of, of different kinds of financial instruments, from debt to equity, um, and, and quasi-equity in between. And that's where you do need you know, legislation or, and legal form becomes really important because you're, you're, you're creating hybrid kinds of, of, of instruments that people don't fully understand. I, this, I had this experience. We created the first uh, quasi-equity investment fund in Canada that invests in cooperatives and nonprofits, and the investment stays for 15 years. You know, so because we realized that that uh, all these short-term debt instruments were were uh, preventing a lot of these enterprises from from growth, uh, from consolidating and from growth. And at the other end is there's a pre-startup. So the question of the life cycle of of, of these uh, social enterprises, whatever we want to call them, I think is is critical. Uh, uh, the diversity of, of, of vehicles um, is critical. Uh, the, the linking of demand and supply and working through intermediaries where they exist, pushing to create them where they don't exist because they don't exist everywhere um, is, is, is critical. And then the other missing piece, and again, you know, I was happy to hear you say these are context specific. We can't compare Germany to, to the U.S. or to, to the U.K. And yet, these models are often taken um, very much from the UK and the US because there's so much work going in that area. But if we look at the UK, particularly right now after the election, and, and the US where there's incredible initiative and innovation on the ground but very little government uh, engagement, uh, 
these intermediaries, where it's possible, um, can work more closely with government to negotiate the kinds of enabling policies that would be necessary for all this to continue to work. So I, I suppose it's it's really a, um, an agenda for you know further or, or, or complementary work that has to be on the demand side, on the policy side, uh, looking at risk mitigation from from a different perspective. Um, although I, I think that your point is so well taken that uh, these days the the risk of, of investing in a bad uh, in a bad initiative is um, is very very high. Mm -hmm. So I think I'll stop there. Um, just you know some some comments.